Good morning. This is January 22nd, 2002. We're in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates. We are privileged to have with us today Henry Slaughton. Henry, they call you Kip. Kip, is that it? May we call you Tip on this yes. tape? Welcome, and we're glad to have you with us. May I ask you when you were born? April 15th, 1918, in London, Connecticut. And your current address? Wellesley, Massachusetts. And your marital status? Married. Children? Three children. My daughter and my two sons. And how about grandchildren? Uh, four. Uh, two boys in Sudbury and two girls in Cotituate. I'm going to take a moment here to, to ask you something that uh, <clears throat> generally we don't get into, but you have a, a, a neat family history. Would you tell us about your dad? Well, my father was born in London in the poor section within the sounds of Bow Bell. He was what we call a gentleman's gentleman. Uh, all his life, except for a brief period in the London when he opened a tailor shop. <laughs> um, he worked for Mr. Cl uh, Sir Thomas Lipton, the tea man, two or three of the Maharajas of India. I think he worked for one of the big German auto producers. When he came over to America, he worked for Morton Downey, Frankie, Mr. Morgan, the banker, uh, and he died in the service of Gun Governor Cox of Ohio, who ran in 1921, I believe, for the presidency of the United States. His running mate was FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, he died in the service of Governor Cox and he's buried in outside of Dayton, Ohio, at Trails, Trails End. Totally appropriate. I, th I thought that was a, uh, a neat story. He was a gentleman. Uh, obviously, and a gentleman's <laughs> gentleman to boot. Uh, no, uh, maybe some of it was false, but uh, I can always recall he, he was a gentleman. That's, that's a nice story. <laughs> Would you tell us uh, when uh, you entered the military services of the United States. I, I enlisted in New York City in 1942. I was discharged in 1945. I had an awful lot of points. How old were you when, when you went into the service? I believe I was 24. And were you subject to the draft or did you enlist or how? No, I was subject to yeah. the draft, but I enlisted. But two years prior to that, I had been working in New York City. Uh, my first job paid me $12 a week. Uh, I was a little unhappy in that. And I went up to Canada, I hitchhiked, bummed my way up to Canada to enlist in the Royal Canadian Air Force in Montreal. I was turned down because one of my eyes was bad. I came back, and I believe when I was coming back, Jimmy Walker was off to Europe with Betty, Betty Compton. Uh, Jimmy had Jimmy his, Walker was the mayor of New, mayor York, New York at that York. time, yeah. And it was about that time he got into scandals. And uh, I came back and went to work again at the same company. And the next year, I also bummed my way up to New York, uh, up to Montreal, applied again to the Royal Canadian Air Force, and I, and was, I was turned down because of a bum eye. And I said, what the hell do I do for it, doctor? And he says, go back and eat carrots. So I went back and I ate about a barrel, of, a, a truckload of carrots. And then in early 42, I got, I said, the hell with it. I'm enlisted in our Air Force, or our 
enlist in the United States Army. And I enlisted in 1942 in New York City, transferred to Camp Dupton, and eventually ended up down in Miami Beach. Mm -hmm. And there I chose the Air Force. I was going to ask you, uh, you, had, you had your choice of the services if you were enlisting. Uh, why did you pick what you did? Well, uh, uh, as I said prior to that, I had gone up to t t Canada twice to enlist. You were determined to you get in the Air Force. I, I got turned yeah. down, and uh, I don't know, I always, the Air Force always seemed to me a better service. It was cleaner, it was more adventure. Uh, and then I guess maybe in the back of my mind I had, if I was accepted and flew, I would get flight pay. That would increase my monthly salary. By 50%. 50%. Yes. Good thinking. <laughs> okay, you were enlisted and, and you, were, you, sent, you were sent down to Florida. Yes, Miami. But Miami Beach. Did you tell us originally that you joined the Army and then at Florida they put you in the Air Force? Is that what we said? No, I think I joined, when I joined, I, I think they said to me, what branch would you like to go in? Now, I, I, I'm not sure of this, but I remember saying, I want to go into the Army Air Force. And when they got down to Miami Beach on the basic training, and uh, I think the sergeant who was giving us training was Lucky Luciano, the big gangster in New York. He was a cousin of Lucky Luciano. Uh, but I picked the Air Force, and then after basic training, they sent me up to Fort Myers, Florida, to the gunnery school. Tell us about basic training. You're 24 years old. Had yep. you been away from home other than uh, hitchhiking up to Canada twice? No. I, uh, this was being away from home, really. I was born in New London, Connecticut. And uh, New London, Connecticut was the home of, while well, I was there, the Coast Guard Academy. The Coast Guard Academy was built. It was the home of uh, Connecticut College for Women. And eventually, I did marry a cat. Uh, kind of college girl. It was home of the United States sub base, and it was also home of the old General Electric, which elect, uh, eventually was bought by uh, General Dynamics, and they made the subs, the S all these The Electric Boat Company. Electric yeah. Boat Company in Groton, Connecticut. And they were making submarines there, the S yes boats. Uh, eventually they got into the atomic subs. In basic training, uh, this is standard army fare where you drilled around? Yeah, or what did they do to you? Forward march, uh, right turn, left turn. Uh, it was basic training. Uh, was any part of your training different because you were in the Air Force and you were going to fly or do something uh, relative to uh, I, aircraft? I, I think it was. I think they just got you down there to uh, indoctrinate you. Uh, so you, you knew how to walk or march. You knew how to salute. Uh, it was just basic training, uh, no specialty. What time of the year was it uh, to be in Florida? Uh, it was the uh, yeah. summer, sir. Hot. Oh, it, was, it was nice. Um, Miami, and we was, we stayed at the uh, a, a hotel. Uh, we used to march out in the golf course. Uh, but it was it was a good life. It was a clean, clean, good food. Uh, and where? And then you went up to Fort Myers. Fort Myers, Florida. Okay. Uh, did you make some friends down there at uh, Miami, and did they go with you? Did you go as a group? No, I can't recall making any friends, uh, but I do go, I remember 
being transported up to Fort Myers, and there I met a good group of men, uh, particularly my instructors. They were mostly old army men who were tra transferred from the army over to the Air Force. Uh, and they were all good men. Sergeant Yoda, Sergeant Wilson. And uh, within eight weeks after getting there, I was a sergeant. You were a sergeant within eight weeks? Eight, eight weeks after getting at Fort Myers. That's uh, rather unusual, isn't it? No, uh, it's quite common. Uh, if you went through gunnery school, you usually came out a sergeant, or you didn't come out at all, you washed out. But no, I came out a, star, a sergeant, and then was asked to stay on as an instructor. Now, at Fort Myers, you're going through gunnery school. Gunnery school. And I'm interested in how do they teach you to be an aerial gunner? What is the process that you went through? So for eight weeks there? Yeah, eight weeks. It was one of... Uh, this is a machine gun, uh, 30 caliber. We usually, you know, learned the 30 caliber because I had never seen a 50 up to that until after gunnery school. Uh, plane identification. Uh, Tell us about that. So you didn't shoot down all the American planes. <laughs> How did they teach you? And did they teach you Japanese and German planes? No, we uh, Just mostly German? concentrated on the, the Luftwaffe, the German planes. Did that tell you anything about where you might be sent? No. Uh, tell us about learning aircraft identification, well, those classes that you went show to. Show us a picture of a uh, ME-109, or uh, a Heinkel. Uh, a quick identification, uh, but you could cheat. I got to know in sequence what the, how the films were coming up. <laughs> or one slide was cracked, so that was the ME-109. Yeah. Right? I, mean, well, I could always tell the ME-109. Because uh, after a while they repeated it so many, many times, uh, it got, I got to know the sequence of how they were coming up. So really, uh, the identification up to that point was, uh, no, I, I learned, if anything comes at you, shoot. Did they show you British planes as well, yeah, and American the, the planes? Yeah, the Spitz, the Hawk, uh, Hawker Hurricanes, uh, Bullfighters. Uh, no, because, you know, if, you're in, if you were in Europe, uh, you could shoot down an Amer uh, Amer American plane or a British plane. Uh, but it was a gradual assimilation and, uh, of gaining the knowledge. Uh, Did you take apart the guns and all of yeah. that? Uh, the 30s and the 50s are pretty much alike. Well, we, we, Just again, one is we bigger than the other. That we weren't on the 30s uh, because they were easier to handle. They could fit into the planes we were flying. These weren't combat planes, they were training planes. Um, and again, uh, the 50s were a uh, real big caliber. Uh, when they hit something, you usually destroyed it. Did you start out on the ground with a, a shotgun? A shotgun? Yeah. Sk uh, skeet shooting. And I couldn't hit the side of a barn door. <laughs> Uh, you know, I was a bad skeet shooter. Uh, I don't know why I was so bad. It was, I think I was a little afraid of guns. Uh, Had you ever fired a gun before? Really, no. And um, suddenly this thing is yeah, thudding into your shoulder. Yeah, the the yeah. recoil yeah. was quite heavy and I was always afraid of getting kicked in the mouth. Uh, no, I, I couldn't hit the side of a barn door. Why weren't you washed out? Oh, uh, I knew everything I did. I did first class. I, I used to stay up at night in the latrine and study. 
on the physical med. I could beat anyone running or going over the hurdles. The only thing I was bad at was the ski. And uh, I didn't improve until they installed the shotguns in the turrets. And then they, we went from the turrets, shotgun and turrets, to uh, 30 calibers, and then eventually to 50 calibers. Are these turrets on the ground in a station, right. and instead of pulling up a, a shotgun, you've, you've got the two shotguns uh, yeah, in the Yeah, all I did was know. I had the, the pedals were here, and the, the, uh, the sight was there, and all I had to do, I didn't get any uh, absorption of the shock. And I wasn't afraid of getting kicked in the face or the mouth. And uh, this way I could, I could concentrate better. And when I did concentrate and didn't think about getting hurt, you know, I uh, did become quite proficient. The turret turned fast enough for you to, to uh, shoot skeet? Really? Mm. Yeah. Well, the, the bird comes out, goes up, either straight or up. Uh, and the object was pick the bird up, lead him, and then fire. Uh, it was almost automatic to lead. You had to lead, and then fire. And, uh, Let's jump ahead, way up ahead. When you really were flying in combat and shooting at, you know, real planes, <laughs> did this training finally pay off? I mean, this is what made you a good gunner later on? I, I really don't know. I, I think a lot of it was, I just liked doing it. I liked the work. I liked the people. I liked the food. I liked the money. Uh, I liked the rest camps. And uh, everyone was nice to me, pleasant, friendly. Uh, I, I, I just did a good job. Do you think instinctively or innately you were a good gunner? That, that some know. guys really had it and some guys didn't? No, I, I, I had luck. I wasn't afraid of the German fighters because it, it took your mind off going over the target or going up to the target or coming out of it. I was more afraid of flak. That was deadly. Yeah. Uh, I flew my first submission as a top turret. We're, we're getting ahead. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me, I, I jumped okay. ahead and uh, you stayed there. Um, after your training here, you're, you've talked about training on the ground. Tell us about now going up in planes and, and firing. Well, I, I, when I finished being an instructor in Fort Myers, I asked for overseas duty. I was sent to Greenville, South Carolina for advanced gunnery. Uh, I was probably there two or three weeks. Uh, At Greenville? Greenville, South Carolina. There we started to shoot 50s. And uh, we was down at Myrtle Beach, coming in, coming up out of the, off the ocean into Myrtle Beach. And we were more or less training for South Pacific. No mention was ever mentioned to me that we were training for Europe, uh, which I was happy. Uh, well, did you get Aircraft recognition for oh, yeah, Japanese got, uh, planes. Always had that for the Japanese planes. Now, uh, not so much. We never got too much of Japanese. Uh, maybe a little, but I, I was always it was most more of the German Air Force, uh, and I always associated the war basically as with Germany. Uh, the Japanese. It was you know, something in the Pacific. Further away. Further yeah, away. Mentally, yeah. And it didn't get the headlines, or I didn't hear as much news about the Pacific as I did about okay. the German Army. There goes the fire department. We're just going to wait a second here. 
<laughs> Air raid. <laughs> Air raid alarm. <laughs> Tell us about being up in the air over Myrtle Beach or out over the Atlantic Ocean and firing. What did you shoot at? Oh, um, in training we shot again at, I can't recall what we shot at. That is, it, it, did you shoot at a, a toad target sleeve, things well, like that? I think that. it was a toad target sleeve. Yeah, how, how did they know whether or not you'd hit anything. Well, again, uh, I, I think, I don't mean, I don't mean dis disrespectfully, I don't, th they always got you, you hit, you know, so many reds or so many blues or so many yellows. They were painted, so when they went through a sleeve, they left a marking. But I don't think <laughs> they ever really gave us a good, what you did individually. Uh, when you landed and the tow plane came down. I never saw it. Oh, I was going to say, did you guys stand around <laughs> and look at the sleeve? No, we landed here, tow plane maybe uh, uh, came down a mile or so away from us. So I really think they falsified a lot of the, what your hits were. And I'll, I'll, I'll also say this. Frankly, when we flew over the Brenner Pass. Beg pardon? When we were flying over the Brenner Pass, the bombing the German Brenner communication. Pass. Yeah. The, after we landed, the reports were, could come in on uh, the accuracy of our hits. And I, I never did believe them. They would say, we got 95% of the target, we got 98%, we got 93%. I don't think we ever got more than 50%. The, the targets were pretty hard to hit. The communication line, uh, the bridges. Um, if we maybe got 100%, if we hit the mountain, the mountain had a landslide and came down over the... Uh, but I, I, I never believed the Air Force on the accuracy of that bombing. Or evidently in, in the shooting either. No, uh, the shooting, uh, uh, we shot at fighters, but it, fighters was, was not a problem. It was a flak. The flak no, was Kip, a problem. Let's, let's go a step at a time here. Mm. I've, I've still got you in South Carolina. Mm. And you're shooting from Lockheed Hudson's, were you? At no, other I think targets? We, we graduated from Lockheed Hudson up to B-25s. Okay, so now you're in a B-25 Mitchell. Sure. And were you assigned to a specific tar uh, turret? Were you top turret, rear turret, nose turret? No, when you were at Greenville, South Carolina, it was a general course. It was learning the mechanics, uh, Plane identification, gun repairs, um, but nothing about I was specifically trained to be a tail gunner or even a waist gunner or a belly gunner or a top turret. Just a gunner. Just a that gunner. That is to say, just a gunner. And you, um, you got a lot of flight time, evidently. Yeah, I did. I had an awful lot of flight time. How often, how many times a day would you go up? Or more than once a day? No, uh, in Florida, Fort Myers and the Gunnery School and the training program, I probably flew about seven missions a day, seven takeoffs and landing a day. They were up, shoot, get back, up, shoot, get back. Now in uh, Greenville, uh, down off Myrtle Beach, they were longer, more, not as many, uh, but the, it was not much better than gunnery school. A little more advanced, but I wouldn't say, to, I didn't learn much. I think my knowledge of uh, the Air Force came through conversations I had with people I met, uh, some of the veterans coming back. Experienced men. Experienced men, and yeah. uh, listening to the RAF, 
or the Polish Air Force, or the South African Air Force, or the New Zealand Air Force. Now, where did you run into these people? In North Africa. Oh, okay, we'll, we'll get there in a minute. Can you tell us, uh, when you're in, in leaving gunnery school, did you then become an instructor, or um, how did you get to do this much flying? Well, after I got, went through gunnery school, and they came up to me as a skip, we'd like to have you as an instructor. I said, good. Uh, so I became an instructor in aerial gunnery. Uh, and I used to take the men through the basic training. Uh, and that's what I did for about a year, a year and a half. They, they must have thought you were a pretty good gunner to make you an instructor to no. teach this to other guys. I don't think so. Uh, Did you, were you able to tell when kids came along and they're starting the process you'd been through, could you tell this guy's going to be really good and this guy, as you said before, can't hit a barn door? No. I, I, if I said yes, I, w I would be lying. Uh, I think I went more on the attitude of the men. If they seemed willing and able, not willing, and uh, was enthusiastic, and was trying to do a good job, I would go more on that than by any specialty or any knowledge of, because I, I think everyone can learn eventually to fire. And I couldn't, but when they put me in a turret, I did come a long ways fast. And again, it was that shock, you know, that uh, 12 gauge had a kick to it. How long were you an instructor? A year and a half? About you say? a year, a little more than a year and a half. And how did you come to uh, stop doing that? and uh, go overseas? Ooh, I got tired of it. Plus we were losing quite a few planes. And one day I went in, you know, for a few drinks. Um, Excuse I, me, by, uh, what do you mean you were losing a few planes? Well, they were, tra the pilots were, they, they weren't advanced pilots, they were trainers trainees, and they would we'd take, take about six or seven men up in a group, and we lost quite a few. And I do recall one night going into a bar in uh, Fort Myers. I got bombed, and uh, I took a room at a hotel, and then uh, when I woke up, I was really <laughs> quite bad. Uh, and one of the girls I called the Ham and Eggs, she worked in the PX, got me onto a bus and took me into camp. I got down to the flight lane and my crew had already, my plane had already, already taken off. Uh, Yoda, Sergeant Yoda, uh, coming back to the base, the pilot was instructed to go around again and the second time around, he went down, and uh, Yoder and about six men plus the pilot died. Um, That's the plane you should have been on? Should have been on. And uh, I remember going out, and there was Yoder's car near the flight line. And it stayed there for two or three weeks. And one day, a, a, some parents came down. And it was his father and mother. I think he was from Nebraska. They took the car away. But the plane that went down, I should have been on it. And I made my mind up, I'm, I'm getting out. I'm going over where it's safer. <laughs> Overseas. Overseas, The combat, yeah. right. Uh, but no, I... Uh, so you, did you have the ability to go in and say, I don't want to do this anymore? That is, could you just resign? Oh, you can't resign. I just went in and said, look, I'd like to go overseas, period. Send me out. And, and I, they, I and didn't they know, did. I didn't know many of the officers very well. And 
as that using, losing Yoda was quite upsetting to me. Evidently, yeah, that's, and you saw it happen. I didn't see it happen, but, you know, I, that was my flight, and when he's coming back, I was told he had, they were about to land, and they said, go around once again. And that's when he went down. Kip, about, about what was the date when you uh, went overseas as a, a qualified gunner? About what month and year? I, I would say it was 1944, probably around June or July. Yeah, about June, May or June. So you went overseas just at the time of the invasion of Europe, the, the D-Day and Normandy and all that. That's some, some timing on your part, right into the thick of it. No, remember I flew off of Corsica, flew over uh, Italy, uh, northern Italy, the Brenner Pass. Our 12th Air Force was devoted to taking out the communication lines between Germany, Austria, and Italy. So that's the concentration on the Brenner Pass. Brenner Pass. Tell us about flying overseas. Where did you leave from? Florida? Uh, we flew out of Greenville to Fort Greenville to Jacksonville. And then from there we flew a B-25 to Puerto Rico, down to British Guiana, and then we hit Brazil, just off the Amazon River, and then we flew over the South Atlantic to the Ascension Islands, which was British, and landed there, and then we flew into uh, Liberia, and then from there we flew into Casablanca, I believe it was, and then into Tunis. Okay, so you took the southern route to yeah. go over and we wound up at Tunis. B-25s. Yeah, that's a long hop. Where were you in the plane? Mm, any place. <laughs> any place you could stretch out, right? Yeah. Yeah. We weren't doing anything. We were just sitting there uh, looking around and maybe once in a while looking down on the water. Did you like to fly? Did you enjoy it? Uh, when I was in the service, yes, but I, after I left the service, I didn't fly for maybe 10 or 20 years. I was scared. Uh, I, I'm even scared now. Now, usually before I take off, I have two drinks. When I get in the air, I have two drinks. When I get in the ground, I have two drinks. I'm glad you're not the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was always scared of takeoffs because if anything went wrong with the plane, that's God bad, damn it, it was all over. Yeah, now, I, right. I remember coming back, I said, if, I, if we can get back, we can land. Even if we crash land, we can land and you can crawl out of the goddamn plane. Uh, but takeoffs, it's over. One little uh, malfunction, anything like that, zoom, you, you, you turn and hit the ground. Um, in Tunis, uh, you, you joined the 12th Air Force, and from Tunis, did you get sent to Corsica from there? Yes, from Tunis we went to Corsica, and I flew most of my missions off of Corsica, up over Italy, northern Italy, the Brenner Pass. And incidentally, as I flew over Lake Garda, I was what, what, what Lake Garda. G-A-R-D-I-A, -A, yeah. because when Mussolini resigned, got thrown out, he went up to northern Italy and formed a, 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 a branch. And he was still under, he wasn't with the Italian army. Mussolini, when he got chased out of Rome, he went up to northern Italy and formed the, the what we call more or less the fascist. Uh, and when I flew over his palace down there, where he stayed, I always turned my guns down <laughs> and gave him a verse. <laughs> I don't know if I hit anything. Just but, saying hello. <laughs> just like, 
But the Mussolini uh, went up there for about a year because he was chased out of Rome by the Italian parliament. Uh, then he tried to escape up to Germany at near the end of the war, and the partisans caught him on a railroad and struck him up. In Milano. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he and his girlfriend. Yeah, there's a lamp post there. Yeah, that, that, I think it was a station, it was a shell station. Can you tell us the name of the field you flew from on Corsica? Uh, Corsica, had, we had no fields. But the whole goddamn east coast of Corsica was an air base. Our 12th Air Force, the 57th Bomb Wing, 321st Bomb Group, 445th Bomb Squadron, which I was attached to, was about halfway down Corsica. On the, on the beach, practically. The airport was on the beach, but all up and down the coast of uh, Corsica was the uh, 57th uh, B-25s and some fighters, too. This was Napoleon's hometown, wasn't uh, it? Was Napoleon's yeah. hometown. Frenchman, a Corsican, and they're tough people. The little Corsican. Uh, they're rough. No, I mean, they're rough, but they're, they're tough. You you ha you're in a squadron of uh, B twenty five. B twenty five. On on the field, your field or others, were there other twenty sixes, twenty fours, seventeens, any of these? I can recall flying. I would see a squadron of B twenty sixes coming up. We'd be flying back as those dumb bastards because the twenty six was a good plane, but it couldn't take much punishment. That's the Martin Marauder. Yeah. yeah. Ma Martin Mar Marauder. It couldn't take much punishment. Uh, they weren't as st steady as a V-25. The V-25 was like a 17. You could shoot the goddamn thing full of holes and it would still get back. We lost boys, but not nearly what the V-26. So we gave them all, most of them to the uh, uh, South African Royal Air Force, or the Australian, or the Polish. <laughs> we gave them a lot of v 20 And we also gave a lot to Yugoslavia. I trained the Yugoslavian Air Force as a, as a in every gunnery. Did you? I had it for eight weeks down in Fort Myers, and I, I made it rough. And these were gentlemen, really. They were all officers, some captains, lieutenants, majors. Learning to be gunners? Well, it was, yeah. that was part of their uh, training, but they were gentlemen, they were well educated. I think most of them went to uh, Oxford or Cambridge. But uh, at the end of the training period, they gave a big party for me in Fort Myers. And I went in there, and it was all celebrations. And then I, suddenly I got swept off my feet by a group of them, and they carried me out down to the water, the river edge, and threw me in. Right. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> your instruction. <laughs> but no, they were, they were gentlemen, though. They were intelligent guys. Were your planes uh, modified to carry the, uh, the nose cannon, the 75 millimeter cannons? Uh, we had some. Usually the armament on our planes were uh, uh, 50 caliber in the nose. Okay. Uh, top turret, we had two 50s there. Waste guns, we had two waste gunners on either side, and we had a tail gunner with two 50s. We carried a lot of armament, but we didn't... I think most of the B-25s that had a uh, 75 millimeter, I think it was, was in the South Pacific. Or they were attacking coastal defense or, uh, or boats. But over there we... You didn't know, have them. We no. didn't have them, no. Would you tell us, take a minute here now, to tell us about what a typical combat mission out of Corsica and you're flying over toward uh, 
where Italy no, and no, Austria no. come together. And there's that's pretty mountainous in that area. It is. Tell us about getting up in the morning and your briefing, getting into your plane, and what happened to you that day? Well, most of the times I was on the base, but sometimes I would take, after a mission, I would head up to the mountains to a village and get a bottle of wine or something and start to drink and then take a hot bath. Uh, then we woke up early and I would look down to see if they, they usually had some sort of a flag flying if there was a mission schedule. Then I'd come down off the mountains and go down to the briefing. Otherwise, I would get in, wake up, have breakfast, get in the truck, ride and drive down to ride down to the briefing uh, station, and we'd be sitting in a big room, and Jeffrey Lynn, the movie actor, <laughs> would get up and say the target for the day is R Remini or. Tripoli, Remini. And then he would tell us about the, uh, the gun, the gu where the guns were, the fighters. Anti-aircraft guns. Anti-aircraft yeah. guns. Uh, and then we all get into the truck again, drive down to the beach, and then hit the planes. Um, there was nothing spectacular about it. We throw our two, uh, throw our parachutes, the chest type. They clipped onto your chest. They clipped on harness. Uh, yeah. the, the old back straps was. <laughs> uh, I get in the plane and in the tail, let's say, and check the the ammunition, check my guns. Uh, I always check my parachutes to see if they were legitimate. Because in Africa, and even in Corsica, the Arabs of bases would steal the parachute and take the silk out of them and stuff leaves or, or rags in them. So a man got hit and he jumped on a plane, he pulled the chute, and the goddamn thing would be full of leaves or, or rags. So I always, put my hand under and felt was what was in there to see if it was silk. And I wasn't carrying a bad parachute. Uh, did that happen with some frequency? How did they get access to your parachutes? Oh, the security was bad. Uh, the American security on the airports was extremely weak. The Germans found that out when they came over one day. Uh, I don't know where they got the bomb fighters, two bomb fighters, British bomb fighters, came in and the goddamn Americans said, <laughs> here are two Englishmen coming in. They came in, they strafed, not a, our uh, air group, the one above us. Uh, I think it was a 446 or something. And then behind them came in a, a, a group of German bombers, they bombed the hell out of them. They bombed the hell out of them and got off the island and flew back up to northern Italy. But the American security was weak. The American Air Force, their count of hits was weak. Tell us about, uh, now you're up there and you're, you're pretty well satisfied that you've, you've got a parachute. Yeah. And, uh, the whole group is getting ready to go. How many planes would take off at a time here? Oof, three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen. Well, out of our squadron, there are probably about eighteen planes out of our squadron. But they could be joined up with other groups yeah. along the way. And you knew where you were going because you'd been to the briefing. Yeah. The briefing. Were there some targets you'd rather not go to, and some you'd think it's kind of a milk run? Uh, there were very few milk runs. <laughs> I'm glad you said that, milk runs. Uh, 
No, as I said before, I wasn't scared of fighters because it, when they came in, you were, your concentration you feel, you, was on them. It was the flack that bothered me because I, if I looked up ahead, all I could see was big black clouds and then, then you could hear them, boom, boom, boom. Uh, and they would start to hit and the, the fragmentation was deadly. Uh, fighters never bothered me, it was a flack that bothered me, simply because it was heavy and it was accurate. The Germans were good. So, let, me, let me ask you a, almost a personal question here. Was it that if a fighter was coming at you, at least you could shoot back? Right. But the flak, you just sit there and take it. No, as, as, as we got up near the bomb run, and we turned to go in on the bomb run, I always said a prayer, Hail Mary, full of grace, get me the hell out of here. Um, no, flak, I was scared of that. Uh, because if it, it didn't hit the plane directly, the frat, when it burst, the frat, flat coming off of it was terrible. Uh, Little no, pieces of shrapnel. Shrapnel. Oh, shred right shrapnel. through the plane, yeah. And uh, because I, uh, my, after, when I got hit, hit the first time, they sent me to a uh, rest camp in Rome. No, that's. Let's expand. You got hit. Tell us, tell us about that. Your plane got hit. Your yeah, plane got hit. And you're wounded. I was wounded, and I got a piece in the head. My flak. I always wore a flak helmet and a flak jacket and so forth. Um, I never wore the big flying suits or big shoes because I figured if I ever got shot down, I got put down to the ground. Don't fight, run. <laughs> run up into the mountains, get away from them. Uh, so I always wore more what the British had, more of their flight suits. Uh, I always wore my helmet after the first five or six missions. Uh, always wore my helmet, my flak suits. But when I started that bomb run, you could see it, you could hear it. Uh, and it was terrible. The fighters, I never, it, it would take your, fighters would take your mind off of what you were doing, what you were thinking. With flak, you just sat there and said, son of a bitch, this is my last mission. This is my last mission. Tell us about getting hit, you tell us. Oh, I think it was over northern Italy. You got hit in the head. Head, so, yeah. yeah. Split my helmet right down. Uh, my flak helmet, big steel helmet. Uh, when it hit, my, I knew my head shook, and I said it was getting warm, and I took my glove and wiped my forehead, and it was full of blood. <laughs> then I got scared. Uh, and I said, I'm hit, I'm hit. I was shouting, I think. And I know finally one of the waist gunners came back. Oh, I came out of the tail. And I sat down because we were still on the bomb run. And he was sprinkling sulfamilamide on my head after I took my helmet off. And uh, I was awful cold. I was very cold. And they put some blankets around me. We came off the target, then headed back to Corsica. Uh, and all the ways back, I was cold. You were going into shock, I, I guess. Well, I don't know if I was yeah. shocked, but I was cool. We landed, and uh, the stretcher came out, and uh, they took me, put me on a stretcher, and then suddenly they said, we, we don't take any limeys. <laughs> I said, I'm not a limey, I'm an American. And I had my dog tag, I said, look, I'm an American. Uh, I said, well, what are you doing in a British uniform? I said, I don't like your uniform. It, it's clumsy. I said, if I ever got shot down, I couldn't run with it. Uh, and I, I finally said, okay, okay. And so I was in the uh, army base in uh, the hospital on Corsica, 
about three weeks. Uh, but as I said, fighters were nothing. It was a flak. Flak was deadly. Was that the only time you got hit? I got hit on my 64th mission uh, in the face by flak, but that wasn't too bad. Uh, the most serious was when I got shot in the head when I split my helmet. Yeah. Uh, How many missions did you fly? Seventy missions. Isn't that an awful lot of missions? Did you volunteer for another round of... Uh, no, uh, I, just, I just stayed there because I liked staying there. I didn't ask to go home because, one, the food was good, the money was good, the drinking was good. Uh, the company, so so. I didn't like the Americans, basically. They always shot their mouth off too much. Bragging, bragging. The Miami, the Royal Air Force was much quieter. The Kent, uh, South Africans were a big bunch. Very loud, very rough. The uh, Australians were a big bunch. Uh, Yugoslav and the Air Force was a, a bunch of gentlemen. Well, these the are Americans, the men you, you described before. Yeah, but the yeah. Americans was always, they had too many planes, they had too much guns, uh, they had too much equipment, they had too much superiority against the Germans. Could you tell us your opinion of the Germans uh, as soldiers against you and uh, in combat against them, what your feeling about them was? No, I always had a lot of respect for the, the Huns of the Germans. Uh, they, were well, they were well trained. Uh, they were dedicated. The generals were first class, particularly Rommel. Uh, but they were fighting, you know, the odds were against them. But damn it, they fought a good fight. They never gave up. And they fought to the bitter end. Uh, I, no, I never could say anything bad about the Germans. Uh, Probably a few group, few small groups, the SS. But the German army, the German commanders were first class people. Well disciplined, well trained. It was their life. How about the equipment? You were flying B 25s, which is probably good. a sensational, it's a great plane. Mm -hmm. What about the equipment the Germans were flying? What did you think of those? Well, the Germans. Uh, on one of my missions, I was coming back, and over northern Italy, uh, we were coming back, and I saw a plane in the distance, and I never saw anything move that fast. And I watched it, and I watched it, and God damn it, it was going fast. It was doing maybe six or seven hundred miles an hour, I think. And when I got back to the base, and got my few drinks to start with from the Red Cross. I uh, got my briefing and Jeffrey Lynn said, Kip, anything to report? I said, yeah, no, nothing to report, except I did see a plane in the distance and I said, I'd never seen anything go that fast. He said, that was a, uh, uh, one of the, not MiGs, uh, it was a, a, a jet. I think it, this it had some jets. ME 262s. Uh, I the, think it was an ME 260, something. but it was a jet. The first German jet, yeah. and they they appeared just as you the area yeah. you were in. Uh, they they had some in northern Italy or southern Germany. They had some in France. Uh, they they came on too late. If they come on early, I think they would have wiped us out. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a a jet, and they were good. No, the Germans were very innovative. Uh, their equipment was first class. Uh, they just ran out of manpower. Uh, equipment, steel, oil, 
time. In time? Yeah. Uh, but they, t they took on too much. Uh, they could have licked England by themselves. I don't, America would have been a tough cookie. But when you took on England and America and Germany uh, and Russia, uh, they wasted um, over a million or two million troops in Russia. Uh, Stalin was a tough cookie. You flew approximately 70 missions, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about your last one and uh, your coming home. Uh, well, we came back by boat, courtesy of the United States Navy. Uh, we left Naples and came into New York City, and I got discharged at Fort Dix in New Jersey. Uh, the, the accommodations on the Navy ships was wonderful, cleanest I've ever seen. The food was excellent, but they couldn't hit the side of a barn door when they had gunnery practice, <laughs> you know, on the way back. Uh, Germany hadn't quite su surrendered yet. So they had these drills on, you know, air, they sent some balloons up in the air. So this is the spring of 45 you're 45. coming home. Uh, what did you do when uh, you got discharged? Oh, I went to work for uh, the AAA for a few weeks. Then I uh, answered an ad in the uh, New York paper for a athletic director, camp director, in, uh, in Bear Mountain State Park. And it was sponsored by the Episcopalian Church of New York. I went up there and I was interviewed by Mr. Holt who had graduated from Wesleyan University. He hired me and for four or five years, during the summer while I was going to school, I was, uh, the, the, I ran the Camp Pequot in uh, Bay Mountain State Park, Lake Stahahi, I believe it was. Uh, and we had maybe 150 boys from New York City and New Jersey, and uh, counselors were mostly college men. Uh, some of my friends from New London, Connecticut, one of the Walgerskis, the, uh, the Bowleys, and uh, I ran that until 1950 when I graduated from Wesleyan with a BA. Um, it was, it was good. It was good. The food was good. The company was good. The cleaning was good. You're a good food man, aren't you? <laughs> but no, everyone was pleasant. Was there in your whole career, uh, military career, a most outstanding, memorable experience that you perhaps think about more than anything else? Uh, in relation to the war, I can't think of any particular one, but I do recall at Greenville, I was in Greenville, and I met a girl, and we got drinking and dancing, and you know, and she said, Kip, come on home. So I remember going home with her, <laughs> and I said, she said, come on in. I said, I can't come in the front door, that's why. She said, I'll open the window in the rear. <laughs> so I go around to the rear, push the window open, she had opened it, and climbed in, and then I said, geez, I gotta take my shoes off and that. And suddenly the lights went on, it was a father mother's room. <laughs> so I grabbed my pants and that, <laughs> and got out of the window and was running down the street. And finally a cab driver came along and said, get me back to Greenville, the air base. And when I got back there, I said, don't go through the gates. Drop me off here. 
so I can go through the grass, you know. And uh, I got, got on the base safely, and then the next morning, uh, I happened to look out, and there was a lady and a man out there, and uh, it was her father and mother. <laughs> uh, I got off the base the next morning. That's when I went overseas. Aha. Aha. But no, no under war, it was, it was a job to be done. Uh, but they treated me like it was wonderful. Uh, the food was good, the company was good, the service was good. And after the war, I applied to my, for my GI Bill of Rights. I never graduated from high school, but I did go up to Columbia. Well, I did co go to West Lynn, and uh, I got a high school diploma. West Lynn admitted me, and the dean said, Dean Costerson, you're the dumbest man we've ever heard. <laughs> and when I graduated, he said, Kip, come here. He said, you're the dumbest man we ever graduated. <laughs> At least you were consistent. <laughs> but uh, my brother Ainsley was uh, a graduate of Wesleyan, 37. He was a Phi Beta Kappa. He was nominated for the Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, he was quite a good athlete, too, particularly in tennis. When you, uh, when you came home, did you join any veterans organizations, or are you a member of any now? Oh, I joined the Veterans of Foreign War for about two or three weeks. And uh, I don't know what I expected, but uh, I didn't like going to these meetings, and all they talked about was war experiences. Uh, so I, I lost my enthusiasm for the, uh, the VFW. Uh, it was probably my fault. Uh, I, I, I like to drink, but I don't like to get drunk. <laughs> um, but no, the VA, the Veterans of Foreign War, was wonderful. Uh, I can't say anything bad or rude or nasty about my period in the service. I was never treated so well, so generously, uh, so curiously. Uh, and the men I ran into uh, were generally good men. Uh, I didn't like the ground troops as much as I liked the Air Force. Uh, mm. The ground troops were a little rough. <laughs> That's a very positive note, and we thank you for coming in oh, today. thank you. Thank you, Kip. Uh, I it's, hope it's I didn't bore you. <laughs> Absolutely not. Thank you. Uh,